The following sermon is a recording from Adventure Community Church in Fresno, California. So Romans 12, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the view of God's mercies, to offer yourselves, or to, excuse me, to offer your bodies or yourselves as a what? Living sacrifice, holy and pleasing unto God. And what's it say? This is your true, what, act of worship. Or as some of you, it, it may say this is the proper form of worship, right? So, and it says what? By doing what? Do not conform any longer to the patterns of this world. But uh, if you're reading out of the old King James, it'll say, but be ye transformed, right? Or be yourself transformed by what? What's it say? By renewing your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve of God's will as good, pleasing, holy, and perfect will for your life. So right here we see the word worship introduced, and it's really interesting because if you were a Jew and you heard the word worship, it would not have the same context as what you think worship is. Matter of fact, worship in the, uh, in the Western church is, is pretty much uh, reduced down to the band. It's like that's worship, right? And then some churches will take it a step further and they'll say, hey, we're going to continue our worship by giving. And so really you got music and you got your tithes and offerings. However, if you were a Jew in a synagogue and you heard the word worship, you would be looking for something entirely different. You'd be looking for an animal to slaughter. Yeah. You'd be looking for an altar, some type of, uh, some type of ram, some type of lamb, and somebody was about to get the blood drained. And that was worship. I'll prove it to you. Head on over to the book of Genesis uh, chapter 22. Uh, I don't know how I ended up in Leviticus. I don't know what I was doing in Leviticus. We're not in Leviticus 22. That's for sure. Check this out. Abraham tested should be the title of your, uh, of, of, of your uh, Genesis 22 chapter. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham? Abraham replied, here I am. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Now watch this. What's the next word say in your Bible? It says what? Sacrifice, right? Watch this though. Go ahead and, and, and you could do this this one time and one time only. And God will not smite you. Take that word out and put in the word worship. Okay, so we're going to take out sacrifice. And, and it says worship him there as a burnt offering on a mountain and that I will show you. And I'm going to show you why we did that in just a second, Okay. Early in the morning, early the next morning, Abraham got up and he loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him to go. On the third day, anybody know anything significant about a third day, right? We all know about a third day. Jesus uh, resurrected on what? The third day. Okay. Abraham looked up and saw the place in a distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there, we will what? Worship. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Notice that he said, we will both come back to you. Okay, we will come back. Not I will come back, we will. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed his son Isaac, uh, excuse me, and, and on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Notice Abraham's prophetic utterance. He said this, Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there. He arranged the wood on top of it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife, and he was going to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your one and only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by the horns. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. For your word, Lord, is my prayer. I speak not as a man, 
uh, but as an oracle of you proclaiming the truth, Lord, and all that you have for us. And Father God, I forbid the enemy from coming and robbing us tonight of this word as we scatter seed, Lord, for all to be blessed. In Jesus' name, we all said? So if we take a look at this, we see two, two times the word worship. We see it in Romans 12, and then we see it in Genesis 22. In both of those texts, we also see the word sacrifice, right? It said that you would offer your bodies as living sacrifices. We saw that uh, Abraham talked to Isaac uh, about a sacrifice. And I said, we could take both those words out because they're interchangeable. When you talk about sacrifice, you could talk about worship. When you talk about worship, you could talk about sacrifice. Matter of fact, if you follow the Old Testament, you will see that it, 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 it talks about sacrificing all the time, and it will actually interchange the word between sacrifice and worship. And if you follow Solomon, it'll say that Solomon worshiped the Lord, but how did he worship the Lord? He sacrificed 1,000 bulls and, and lambs and rams and all these things. He sacrificed all these animals, and he placed the blood at the altar, and it was an incense unto the Lord. It was a, as a fragrance unto the Lord. So these words are interchangeable. So in the New Testament church, how are we supposed to understand worship? Does it mean more than music? Or is music just an entry point? Or is music just an accessory? Or what exactly is going on if we're supposed to present our bodies as living sacrifices? How are we supposed to do that? And then what does worship look like for us? First off, you notice that it says present your body. Your body is what you worship God with. And your body is an instrument. Your body is an instrument. Inside your body, you have what's called vocal cords. That is string music. It is, it, is, it is a wind instrument in which you get to glorify the Lord with your body. The way you treat your body, the way you honor the Lord with your body, all these things are worship. There's an element of this worship that only you can provide, and it's called song. It is called singing unto him, not unto just this with musical instruments in the band, but it's called that we can have a life of praise. And that life of praise is going to take on so many different uh, directions and it's going to take on so many different looks. And I want to let you know, and what I've come to do is talk to you about the benefits of worship. And the first thing you need to know is worship is all up to you. I love how Abraham said to them, you guys have went on this journey, the servants has, have went on this journey, but you've reached a point where you can go no further. It's just me and the boy. And I, I, you, you need to know that there's a, there's a, a, a job that our worship leaders uh, like to do. We like to get you to the presence of God, but being before the presence of God, you got to go there on your own. There, we can only lead you so far. We can only get you to clap so long and sing so loud. And, and sooner or later after that, we know that it's about us going before Jesus. And what we're trying to do is help you get there, but to step in to the presence of God, you got to do it by yourself. We can't coach you in there anymore. This is a step that you got to voluntarily take. So here's Abraham. He got everything ready. He got the wood ready. He got the fire lit. He got the knife in his pocket. He's got his son. He's got the rope. He's got the stones to build an altar. He is completely ready to do what? To worship the Lord on Mount Moriah. And so that we see this as a type of a shadow that we need to get our worship ready. And I think a lot of times we come into church and we hear a good sermon, and then we walk out, and we forget what the sermon's all about because lunch was so good. Come on. It's like, man, I couldn't believe Kuka's was that good today. It is good almost every time I've been there, by the way. And then all of a sudden, you forget. And there's been plenty of times that it took you by the end of church service before you even started feeling the presence of God. And that's because we don't come prepared because we are not living a lifestyle of worship. A lifestyle of worship. So what I want to get you to do and what I want to get you to understand is that every time we know a service is getting ready to start, our worship starts beforehand. We have to prepare ourselves to get ready to receive God's word. You have to prepare yourself to get ready to receive God's word. And why is that? Because there's going to be so many distractions. I can't believe how many people are distracted even in church. The phone will ring. You'll get a text message. You'll get a Facebook push notification. Somebody will like your Instagram or your Twitter or is Vine, right? Your Vine. 
I mean, all these different things, all that to keep you distracted. I can't believe how many folks' phones go off during church. Come on, somebody. You know what I mean? I can't believe it. I mean, I feel like we got to kind of do what the movies do. Please silence your cell phones, right? And then that stupid commercial we've all seen before the movie, obnoxious, rude, you know, when they're answering the phone and stuff. It's like, man, you got these things burned in my head now. But we do, we get distracted. And the most important thing is the Word of God. The most important thing is the Word of God. So why wouldn't the devil distract you? Why wouldn't the devil try to give you every excuse to get your mind on something else? And so we've got to prepare our hearts before we even get into church so that we can receive what God has for us. This is the most important moment right here is what we have with the Lord. I put most people don't receive the word of God because they haven't prepared their hearts for the message by engaging in worship. They are worried about everything else except the one thing that matters, which is your personal time with Jesus. Because if truth be told, we don't really have that time outside of church on a daily basis because we just got too many distractions. So here's what I want. Here's my whole goal tonight is I want to get you to understand that preparing our hearts before we come to church is so important. Taking that first song to prepare the atmosphere for what we have for Jesus is so important. Why the first song of worship is so important that's why you, you, you shouldn't come in late to church. You managed to make it to the movies early. Come on, somebody. I ain't talking to nobody. I'm preaching. Baby, get over here so I can just preach to you. Come here, girl. Come right here. You ever notice that? Yeah, yeah, but is, is that the truth? You're you going to make it. Now, I know some of you just late. you late. you late to your own kid's wedding. You know what I mean? You're going to be late to your own mama's funeral. I mean, some of you, we're going to give you a pass because you're just late. Where you at? Go ahead. Don't be shy. Okay. <laughs> I knew you were going to raise your hand, Michelle. <laughs> I just, I knew it. Like, you know me, Pastor. Here's the, Tony. <laughs> Tony. Uh, we're going to do counseling after service in the back. All right. But we understand that. But listen, we got, we got, to, we got, to, we got to get here for the first song. Because and, and, and let me give you the first, if you want to take notes, this is the first reason why. Because worship prepares the atmosphere. Music changes the mood. Where's Kim? Kim. Kim, where'd you go, Kim? Kim, come here. Oh, there you are. Hi, Kim. Kim. Come on up here. Jump on the keys for me real quick. Watch this. I want to show you guys something. Music prepares the mood. Music makes everything better. Try watching a movie without the music on. And, I mean, somebody said, how do you, how do you watch scary movies? Just mute the, mute the TV. And you ain't scared no more. It's that creepy music. Even, even announcements would go better with music. Go ahead. Just give me some ambiance or something. Give me, go ahead. Turn her up a little bit, too, please. Turn it up. Watch. Yeah, that's good. Watch, if you're a first-time guest, we want to welcome you. Pull out your checkbook. <laughs> oh, no, you're doing great. I just feel like, like there's supposed to be some sentimental story right now. It's like, go ahead. And there was a puppy. Begging to come home. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> Give Kim a hand. It changes everything. Go ahead and post on Facebook right now. If you weren't on church tonight, you missed it. Greatest. No, I'm just kidding. It changes everything. I remember, uh, I'm going to date myself here real quick, but I remember uh, being in the uh, seventh grade. And how many 80s babies we got out there? How many 80s babies? We got 80s babies? Okay, so, so I, remember, I remember being in the, in the seventh grade. And, and, and some, some of you 90s babies, y'all imitated us, but it wasn't this good, all right? And I remember being in the seventh grade, and if you, were trying to, if you were trying to talk to somebody, first off, you had a rotary phone. Come on. You know you were mad when you messed up on the number because you had to start all over again. And it was like, you got to be kidding me. Okay, so then once you got on the phone, you did what I did, what everybody did. If you were really trying to talk to somebody, you had to have a... A little bit of background music when you were talking to the person. You were like, go ahead and turn that up just a little bit more. Oh, yeah. Oh, hey. And, you're, and you were like, hey, girl. Yeah, I'm missing you too. Mm. I know it's only been an hour. So what'd you have for a snack after school? <laughs> but you did. You prepared. You prepared the atmosphere. You had you a... Slow jam mixtape. 
<laughs> and you prepared the atmosphere. You like you knew you couldn't just go up on the phone with no music in the background because the music was expressing some things. And he and it just you know it's like yeah I miss you too girl. And then at the very end it was no you hang up. No you. It so it prepares the atmosphere. Music has the ability to change the atmosphere. I can prove it to you. When Saul, when King Saul was being plagued and tormented by evil spirits, he called for the best musician in the land. He called for David, and every time David played his harp, the demonic presences would leave. Every time David played his harp, Saul would feel happy again. He would feel at peace with God because it ushered in the presence. That's why you can go to the gym and undoubtedly... If you see some guy going berserk on the weights, he's got some type of like heavy metal or gangster rap. He is never lifting to worship music. He has never just got all these massive weights and all of a sudden go, and I love you, Lord. Okay, I'm about to get to those weights again. No, they got, they're geared up. They're just, they're just tanking right now. They're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're just going crazy. Music changes the atmosphere. Go to a sporting event. And when they feel like your team is losing momentum, they're going to do something to try to get you excited and try to get you to help change the momentum. But we come into church and we get all nervous and we do not prepare the atmosphere. All of a sudden you got conservative. But you were just the one painting your face at that event. Going, getting all crazy. Acting like, as my kids would say, a fangirl. Okay? But all of a sudden you get into church and you're like, I can't clap. Nope, my hands are staying right here. You have to prepare the atmosphere. It is a game changer. Jake read that scripture that talked about clapping your hands and shouting unto God with a voice of triumph. Why? Because God's going to give you the victory. But it starts with you preparing an atmosphere of praise. You're not too cool to clap your hands. You're not too cool to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. There are going to be times that you're just going to be in your kitchen and you're going to need to give God some praise. You can't worry about the neighbors. It doesn't hurt you cuss out your, you know, your sibling or your, or your family member. Next time, just let them hear you praise. Well, I don't want to be like a hypocrite. You're just keeping it real, right? If you're going to say the one thing's keeping it real, well, keep it real on the other end. Say, you know what, I'm in process, and so this is going to be a new me, a praiseworthy me. It might sneak up on you, start speaking in tongues, not the other tongues, the real tongues. No interpretation needed. But prepare the atmosphere. Prepare the atmosphere. It is so important. Number two, worship prepares your heart. Worship prepares your heart. I put this in my notes. Worship, and it was funny, this is what you said, uh, Bethany, we are talking about the heart. Worship builds up your heart. And when you worship, it's revealing what's in your heart. I hear people tell me all the time, I just didn't feel like worshiping God. How is that possible? I don't get it. I don't feel like it. No, you don't feel like putting away laundry. Come on, somebody. That was a good word. That was almost prophetic. That was, you know, I don't feel like making dinner. Whoa. Okay, but here's the deal. When it comes to worshiping God, that's when you know you need to press in. He's not asking if you feel like it. He just wants you to know that he's worthy of it. And so worship builds up your heart. So why? Because conflicts and situation reveal your heart. Conflicts and situations, they reveal your heart. Sitting in a counseling session one time, the man said something to his wife. It was very bad. And, and, and he said, I don't know where that came from. And my quick response was, well, from your heart. It came from you. I didn't even know it was in there. Oh, it's there. We all know it's there because we all heard it. Well, I didn't know it was, it was always there. It was just waiting for the right opportunity to pop out. You ever been in a situation, all of a sudden something came out of your mouth and you were so embarrassed, and you're like, where'd that come from? From you. That came from you because it was so suppressed and you didn't give it to Jesus and now it's just spilling out over. But it came from you. And so these situations, these circumstances, it reveals what's in your heart already. And that's why people say, well, I didn't really mean that. Yes, you did. You did mean that or else you wouldn't say it. 
Now, you may be in process of forgiving me or in process of letting it go, but right now, that's what you mean. And so we need to work on that. And so what worship does, worship builds up your heart. Worship allows you to have a moment between you and Jesus. Worship is not made for you to be a spectator. It's made for you to experience. It's made for you to experience. It's made for you to go, oh, this is what it's all about. Jesus, I'm coming to you. You know, uh, I, I, meet, I meet people and they'll, they'll say something like this to me. Oh, I can't wait till I get off work because I got to go have a drink. Well, here's my response to that. What you don't bring to Jesus to fix, you're going to keep drinking away. And I tell people, I ain't afraid to tell them that. No, what you need to do is you need to give it to Jesus before that drink turn into two, turn into three, turn into you got a problem. I hope, I hope you caught that. Are you saying drinking's bad? Maybe for you it is. I don't know. But I know if you can't stop at one, you might want to reconsider. When you start saying this, I got to turn to this instead of Jesus, you might have an issue. Hey, listen, I'm trying to help you. You know the number one thing most alcoholics say? I don't know how I ended up like this. Hey, this is what I do for a living, man. I counsel people all day. And this is the stuff that I don't know how I ended up like this. You're talking to a bona fide food addict. I'm going to tell you how I ended up like that. You turned to a Twinkie instead of Jesus. That's how. I'm speaking from experience. All right, maybe it was more like a cupcake than a Twinkie. They, they, didn't, they, they, they switched up the formula a while ago. It was messed up. It was not a good comeback for him. So it's an excerpt. You have to turn to Jesus first, and that's what worship does. Worship prepares your heart, so you start turning to him first, and it prepares your heart, and it keeps him number one. I put this in here. I, I put this in here. It says this in, in Matthew 12, 34, for whatever is in your heart determines what you say. That's why you'll meet people who all hell could be breaking out against them, and they still find the strength to praise and worship the Lord. Why? Because it was already in their heart. What you're sowing in today, you'll be reaping the harvest for the years to come. You got to sow it in there right now. You have to. And so worship prepares our heart. It turns our focus back to Jesus. I want to challenge you with this. You're having a rough day. Your boss came in, lit into you for no reason. On your way home, instead of going home, and I see this every day, and taking out on the family, I've been guilty of this myself. Why don't you put on some music, and before you even step through the door of your house, get your heart right? Because you know what's going to happen? I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. We're going to keep it real right here, okay? Look at your neighbor and say, we're going to go there right now. Go ahead. We're going to go there. This is what happens to all of us. To all of us who, who we were at work, we got a bad phone call, you getting blamed for somebody else's dumb mistake, right? Not, you know, that happens. And your boss lit into you, and all of a sudden on the way home, because you didn't take it to Jesus, you let it fester, and you let it get underneath your skin. You walk in the house, and, and I don't know about you, but I hate a dirty kitchen. Could I get a witness? And all of a sudden, you walk into a filthy kitchen, and it seems like nobody even knows how to rinse out a bowl. Or, you know, or, or how many of you know that once the trash lid does not close anymore, the trash needs to go out? Come on. And, and don't act like you don't know where the trash can is. Okay. And so you get home, and you're heated, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you open up the fridge, and you're hungry. There ain't nothing to eat because then nobody make dinner, and the first person who comes across your path, you know it's on. <laughs> and so you start yelling, and all of a sudden, the dog came out with your favorite pair of white shoes, and, and all of a sudden, now you're heated, and the first person who comes out the room is dead. And they, and they get all the heat. And normally it's your spouse. Come on, somebody. And then all of a sudden you're griping and you're mad and you're complaining. And then you walk off and this is what you realize. You don't feel no better. But you just took it all out on one person. And now it's all rolling downhill. So finally the cat gets it, right? Because the cat, there's nobody, you know, he's the bottom of the list here. And then you go in the room and you know what you realize? It didn't help anything. Nothing got fixed, nothing got solved, nothing. And now you're mad at yourself because that's not how you wanted to start your evening. Could I just inter interject this? What would happen if before you even walk in the house, you threw on some worship song and he said, Jesus, I just need you. I need you because I'm grumpy, I'm irritable, I'm upset, 
And don't nobody deserve this wrath that I'm supposed to, that I'm probably going to go in here and do. I just quiet my soul. What would happen if you opened up the word of God and said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. I shall trust in him and not be afraid. Though an army come to besiege me or an angry boss come to whoop at me, I will not fear him because he does not control me. But one thing I ask, one thing I seek, O oh Lord, is that I would dwell in your house forever. And you walk in and you say, Lord, the second I walk in this door, your presence is going to meet me because I worship you. You prepare your heart. Last but not least, did you know worship prepares you for war? People always ask, how did Jesus overcome the cross? Because he spent all night praying. How, why did Peter mess up? Because he spent, the, he spent the night sleeping. Go back and reread that story. So Peter was asked by Jesus. He said this, hey, could, could you stay and watch and pray with me? Because they're going to be coming. And Jesus goes in and he has the cup and he says, Father, if you're willing, you'll let this pass from me. He gets up because the Bible says he's sweating drops of blood. He gets up and you know what he finds Peter and the crew doing? Sleeping. And he goes, hey, I need you guys to wake up and pray with me. Peter, if you don't pray with me, you're going to fall in to temptation. No, I won't, Lord. And he goes, Peter, you, you, you get caught slipping now. You're not going to have what it takes when the battle comes. You're going to mess up and deny me. No, I won't, Jesus. I'll go to the cross, but you know you won't, Peter. The rooster's going to crow uh, three times before tonight, and you'll already have denied me. No, I won't, Jesus. Jesus goes off, and he prays again. He comes back. Peter, can't you not pray with me? Yeah, Jesus, I got your back. I got your back. Peter falls asleep again. And the third time, what happens? Peter cuts off Malchus's ear, takes off on a 100-yard sprint. Jesus is arrested. A young girl goes up to Peter three times and says, don't you know Jesus? And he says no, and he takes off cussing. If you don't take the time to allow, to allow worship to be your warfare, you are going to lose every battle you fight. If you don't take the time to, to have worship a part of your daily routine, you're going to lose the battle. You're going to lose every battle you come into conflict with. Some of you are trying to beat addiction, you're going to lose that battle. Because you're not preparing in advance because worship prepares you for war. It goes before you. If you go back uh, to 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat was in a world of hurt. Everybody was going to team up on him. They said, we're going to come for you, sucker. We're going to kill you and your children, and we got you. He turned around, he ripped his clothes, and he said, God, help me. And he began to worship the Lord, and he said, Lord, if you don't come through, I'm dead. And all of a sudden, everybody joined in with Jehoshaphat and began to sing and to worship the Lord. And the Lord spoke to a prophet. The Lord spoke to the prophet. He said, I want you to know that I heard your worship. It sounds so good. And I got news for you. All those people who are coming after you, they ain't going to know what hit them. They have no idea what's coming. But because you took the time to worship me, I'm going to make them kill each other. I mean, I am just going to show you that I got your back and you ain't got nothing to worry about. As a matter of fact, I just want you right now to gather all the people together and have you a worship service. So Jehoshaphat called everybody in. He said, get the person on the drums. Get, 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 you know, get little homie to come up here and sing us a song. You know, get the guitar going, get everything going. All of a sudden, they had this huge worship session. I mean, they were just worshiping and worshiping and worshiping till the next day. And then it was time for battle. And they were like, well, what do we do? What do we do? I mean, let's go get the toughest guys and let's put them in the front. Let's, you know, let's, let's go get little JoJo. He's bad, man. He's going to kill at least 100 of them. Man, he be worshiping all night. He's juiced. He's ready. And Jehoshaphat says, no. Oh, okay, you want like them Navy SEAL type fighters. Oh, yeah, we, we got like 1,000 of them. We're going to put. He goes, no. Oh, you want that one dude. Yeah, we're going to do a single battle. Yeah, we're going to get that one dude, that big buff dude, you know, swing like five swords at once, fight a little bit like, I don't know, like Jet Li. You know what I mean? He's bad, right? We're going to get that dude. No. Well, Jehoshaphat, who are we going to get? He said, I want you to go get me the worship leader. You ever met most worship leaders? If you can't see my face because we ain't on video, you ought to see my look right now. You ever see most worship leaders? I am not intimidated from most worship leaders. And they're 12 inch biceps. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying it to be mean. I'm not saying it to be mean. And, and you know, and their fluffy hair that they, you know, that they, that they got to do, you know? And their up to date tattoos and, you know, all that stuff. You know what I mean? I, I'm not, 
But all of a sudden, Jehoshaphat said, yeah, then I want you to go get the choir. You see most people in the choir. They don't look like they do much warfare. And they looked at Jehoshaphat, and they said, Jehoshaphat, you for, you know, they're from the hood. They were like, you for reals? <laughs> you know, there's a hood church right there. You for reals? You know, if you're Mexican, you know, you say, <laughs> you serious? Come on. Serio? Serio? Yeah, I'm serious. Like right now, right now, right now, right now. So all of a sudden, he says, yeah, I get the worship leaders. It, it, I don't think they had electric guitars, bro. They had harps. I'm not trying to clown, but can anybody picture the harp people going first? It's like, what y'all doing? Man, we're going to be playing some beats, bro. <laughs> it does not look scary. I mean, and here you are going, yeah, these are our guys. We, yeah, we're going to win. And so all of a sudden, there's these whole ruthless people, these, these bands of armies ready to kill him. And Jehoshaphat has got the, the, the gospel choir going out in front. He's got the worship leaders going out in front. And they got like a dozen harpists. And, and they got like two percussionists. And, and they got some flute players maybe. I don't know. And they got some shafar blowing people. That's little ram's horns. And, and all of a sudden, they're looking at it going like, and these people are going to fight us? Oh, we about to mop them up. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, they began to say, Great is the Lord who is worthy to be praised. His mercy endures forever and his love knows no end. Great is Yahweh. Great is Elohim. Great is our God. And all of a sudden, the Bible says every one of them started turning at each other and just ensured disarray and panic and started killing each other. As the worship got louder, they killed each other all the more often. As the worship got stronger, they just started to fall over dead. As the worship and the praise began, and as the people of Israel saw the people were dying, they began to hit a beat, and they began to drop it like it was like nothing else. And all of a sudden, they just hit this one song saying, great is our God who prepares us for war. Great is our God who's not going to you know, make us look stupid. And all of a sudden, they just fell over dead. And to the point hit, they all ran and scattered. Worship prepares you for war. The next time you get that collections notice, go ahead and lay it out before the Lord and say, Jehovah Jireh, my God will provide. And just start making you up a song right now. I don't care if it makes sense. I don't care if it's offbeat. Be like, be, have your own fake organ going. And the Lord mm, will pay my bills. <laughs> you got to do whatever you need to do. But instead, this is what you do. Oh, another collections notice. Yep, I'm going to be broke again this month. No, worship prepares you for war. It goes before you. There's a reason why it says clap your hands, all you people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. There's a reason because when you clap your hands, you are banging these cymbals and you're letting the enemy know that as long as you have breath, it will be to praise the Lord. It will be to praise the Lord. There are some times you just need to get outside yourself and begin to give God the praise and glory that is due to his name. We can't be silent anymore. We can't be silent. We can't. My kids remember this. The worship team is going to come on up. We're going to end off with worship. Because we're going to practice what I just preached. When my kids were little, Hillsongs came out with one of the greatest albums ever. It's called More Than Life. And there was a song called One Way Jesus. One way Jesus. And so the song would come on every morning after I made my kids breakfast. And then it came on because I played it. <laughs> and all of a sudden, we all had a little dance in, 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 our, in, in our house. went kind of like in, a, in, a, in like a track circle. And so when the part one way Jesus would come on, we'd just take off running. We'd take off running in this one little circle. And we'd put our hands up in the sky. And then uh, one way Jesus, would, with that whole chorus, and we'd jump up and down. And we'd take our one finger. We'd point it to heaven. And we talk about how there's only one way to Jesus. Still to this day, my kids will bring it up. They go, Dad, do you remember you used to play that one way Jesus song? You used to make us dance and run around. Well, I didn't make you do anything. You were just kind of following me. Because <laughs> it was cool. That's the atmosphere. I want to encourage you. Your worship will change everything. It will change everything. You go to the doctor and you get a bad report, what do you run to? 
Who do you run to? I know I turn to the Lord. I begin to pour out my heart. My best moments with Jesus are not found in a corporate setting. Anybody who knows me best knows where they will find me. They'll find me with my guitar. My guitar. That just came out way too fast, huh? <laughs> See, if you'd have been playing a little bit stronger, we'd have set that mood right there. I wouldn't have messed up on that point. They find me with my, with my, with my faithful guitar. And I'm singing songs. And I'm just worshiping Jesus. I'm just spending time with the one person who changed everything. Whether it's good news or bad news, I want to spend time with him. And church, if there's one thing I can, I can just share with you, when's the last time you prepared your heart before a Sunday service? The second you got in the car, you're just like, you know what, right now, I come before you, Lord, and I already want to be ready before I even get there. Even on a Sunday morning before you even roll out of bed, it's like, Lord, thank you that I woke up today. There are folks right now who can't even get out of bed, struggling to take a, a deep breath, and here it is. Two-thirds of the, the world ain't even going to have hot water as you turn on the hot water. Lord, I thank you that your mercies are new every day, that I even had the money to pay for this hot water right now. You know, because truth is, you could be taking a cold shower. Lord, thank you for the clothes I got. They're not perfect, they ain't new, but they're clothes. You start to prepare your heart. You prepare your heart. You walk into the church, somebody says, it's good to see you, thank you. It's good to see you, I've come to worship. Somebody walks in and they want to talk to you. I'm going to talk to you after service. I ain't trying to be rude, but I got to get my worship on. I, I got one hour. This is it. This is it. I need to get all of Jesus in this one hour I can get. Yeah, you know, about 15, 20 minutes, we're going to have a snack time, and I'm going to talk your ear off right there. I even, I even go with you to the snack table. But I got to worship. And then you focus in on what really matters, which is Jesus. He's all that matters. Nothing else matters. Stand with me. What song is it? Go ahead and close your eyes. I gave you some illustrations on how we can focus in on the Lord and how music sets the atmosphere. I want to challenge some of you with your eyes closed and your heads bowed. I want to challenge you with this. Maybe for the rest of this week, all that plays in the car is worship music. That's it. Not the talk radio. Not the sports talk. And trust me, I've been guilty of this. I'm not, I'm not going to sit here and try to fake it. I've been guilty. You start knowing more about your favorite basketball team than you do about the heart of God. And all of a sudden, you find yourself being consumed by how many points they scored or who's injured, who's not injured, or who said what, or who won the election, or you start getting carried away on every whim except for the one thing that matters, which is Jesus. So maybe it's just time we just turn on the worship music, and you ready? Here it is. We detox. If you found yourself short with people, no grace for people, you found yourself being a little edgy, a little chippy, maybe it's time you turn all that other stuff off. And maybe it's time you just detox with the presence of the Lord. Maybe it's time we just do what the old folks used to do. You just grab your Bible and you spend a little time with Jesus. Maybe it's time you go on a walk and it's just a, a praise walk. It's just, Lord, thank you for the trees and thank you for the dirt. Thank you that we got even a place to walk. Not a gripe session, but a praise session. 
Well, I don't feel like it. You ain't got to feel like it to be thankful. But we need to get into his presence. So right where you're at, let me walk you through it. Go ahead and close your eyes. I want you to start by just thinking of a few things you can be thankful for right now. Think of about five to ten. And we're going to take a step of faith. Right where you're at, go ahead and start thanking him. Go ahead, out loud. Go ahead, you just thank him. Remember, this ain't a time to be all quiet as a mouse. Because we know if you were in front of a sporting venue, you'd be going crazy. So go ahead and thank the Lord. Just go ahead. Just go ahead. Jesus, I thank you for the breath that you put inside my lungs. I thank you that I ate a meal today and that I even had the money to buy it. Jesus, I thank you for the gas in my car. I thank you for my vehicle. I thank you, Father God, that there's tires that I even got, was able even to get here to church. Lord, I thank you that I had clothes to wear and they were washed. Lord, I thank you for my family. Father God, we're not perfect, but we love each other. Lord, I thank you for my home, Lord. You provided that we might be a blessing to others. Lord, I thank you for my church. Hey, just keep going now. Just keep going. If you had the things you're thankful for, just keep going. Let it begin. Let it begin to just rattle off. You keep saying what you're thankful for. Just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep going. Lord, I'm thankful for that job. Because, Lord, there's folks out there right now that do not have a job. Lord, I thank you right now for the family you put me in. Although we are not perfect, I still have a family to call my own. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have always come through. You've never left me nor forsake me. Father, I thank you for your son Jesus who died In my place, Father God, who paid a price that I could not pay. Jesus, I thank you for the cross. You didn't have to do it, but you did it because you loved me. Jesus, I thank you that you left heaven and you came down here to be with us so that we might see the one and only, the the begotten of the Father. And I thank you that you came here as a lamb, but you're returning as a lion. I thank you, Jesus, that you've not forgotten about me that you know the trials I'm going through, you know the burdens that I'm carrying, and Father God, you are here to lift those burdens off me. Jesus, I thank you that you prepare my hands for war, Lord, that I'm not I'm not going to be overtaken. I'm not going to be left high and dry. I'm not going to get my butt kicked because you go before me, Jesus, and I thank you right now. I want you to begin to bring your problems to Jesus. Go ahead. Bring, take that. Just take control of the atmosphere right now. Begin to tell him how worthy he is. Go ahead. Speak it out loud right now from your mouth. Speak it out. I'm teaching you how to worship God. Tell him he's worthy right now. Jesus, you are worthy. You are worthy, Jesus. You are worthy of my praise. You are worthy of my attention. You are worthy of my time. You are worthy of my prayers. You are worthy of my affection. You are worthy of my meditation. You are worthy of the songs in my heart. Jesus, you are worthy. I thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead. Begin to stir it up. Tell the Lord how much you love him. Don't stay silent, church. Don't stay silent. Go ahead. Press in with me. Come on. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you love him. Jesus, thank you. Thank you. There's a whole nother nother level of worship you could go to right now. Go ahead. Begin to tell him how much you love him, how worthy he is. Stir it up, Lord. Stir it up, Lord. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Here at Adventure Community Church, we believe in one step closer. Whether it be one step closer in your relationship with Christ, or one step closer in slaying that Goliath that stands in our way, we believe in the power and person of the Holy Spirit to take us one step closer. That through an intimate prayer life and an understanding of God's Word, there is no limit to what God can use us for.